All right, we're recording now. Okay, um, hello everybody. Welcome to the monthly EFF Austin Meetup. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin, which is a longstanding Austin-based digital civil liberties organization going on 30 years now. We are closely affiliated with uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, which is based out of San Francisco, and is the nation's oldest and most prominent uh, digital civil liberties organization. They're basically the ACLU for the internet is a quick and easy way to think of them. Um, they fight for issues like net neutrality, end-to-end uh, -end encryption, you know, right to have your First and Fourth Amendment rights protected in emerging technological and digital spaces and just generally making sure that technology is a uh, force for good and not bad in this world. Um, so um, as always, things continue to be a little unusual given the current state of the world. Normally we would have these meetups in person, but they continue to be virtual for the time being. Um, they are and continue to be on the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, we have several meetups booked throughout the rest of the year. We're gonna have our uh, board member, Ritika, talking to us next month. Um, she is a tech lawyer and gonna be discussing certain things in her area of research. I imagine it will probably be somewhat adjacent to what she talked about in her last talk with us on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, so that's a rather important issue in the digital space right now. So I recommend if you care about people's ability to say what they want to say on internet platforms, that's an important one to attend and become educated about. We're also going to have our board member, John Webkowski, speaking. I can't remember if I'm having him do November or December, but it will probably be, and he hasn't told me about what yet, but it will probably be quite informative and enlightening. John always has very prescient thoughts on the direction of internet society and where it is moving and going. So I think it's always a treat to hear his thoughts on these topics. So that should be a good one. We're also going to have a meetup. It will be the one that John is not of November or December. We're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Sharon Strover at UT Austin. She's a professor there, and she's going to be sharing with us some of her research on online disinformation campaigns, which isn't newsworthy in any way or relevant at all to what's going on in the world. So um, you clearly don't have any reason you need to go to that. Um, yeah, so that's what we got coming up in the short term. Um, also, um, we, I guess the biggest campaign EFF Austin is working on at the moment is we are continuing to try to collect signatures to present a petition with Electronic Frontier Foundation's help to the Austin City Council trying to get Austin to ban the use of facial recognition technology for law enforcement personnel. Um, you should sign it if you've not signed it and tell your friends to sign it because there could be thousands of people in the city who want this to happen, but if we don't have a nice list of names to go to city council with, we don't have the political pressure to make them actually act on this. And now, given the current defunding police movement, is a great time to act on this where our message may be more likely to be heard and actually get results. So I'm going to share the link here in chat to where you can go and put your name on that petition if you've not already done so. And I encourage you to share it far and wide uh, because the more of you share it, the less I will have to waste money paying Facebook to show it to people so that we can actually get signatures. Because in COVID times, I can't stand out in front of the HEB very easily, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, let's see. Anything else I need to go over? Oh, um, also, I, let's see. I think I've gone over the stuff we've got on the really short term, but I also like to usually pull the community and see if uh, there's any uh, noteworthy news that people in the community would like to uh, share with us. Shameless self-promotion is totally allowed and encouraged. So uh, if you have something you would like to share that's relevant to the EFO Austin community's interests, by all means, feel free to shout it out. Is there anybody who would like to share something? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if so. Hey guys, um, David here. I just wanted to offer you the opportunity to participate in a reading group. Um, the book will, would be The Rise of Big Data Policing. Um, it's written by a um, law professor at Columbia, Uni Columbia University, um, and it's an examination of well, exactly what the title says, big data policing. Um, so if you would be interested in, you know, 
reading and discussing kind of regularly, maybe bi-monthly or whatever, uh, just kind of shoot me a message and uh, we can try to get something together. And uh, for those of you who don't know, David is also on the EFF Austin board. So yes, this is a project that we're all putting together, but David is spearheading as one of our uh, resident researchers and philosophers. So uh, it's certainly a good project in his wheelhouse and should be a lot of fun. So I guess, David, my only question for you is for people who are interested, uh, could you maybe put in the chat both the best means that they could follow up with you about this as well as potentially a way they could obtain or find the book? We'll do. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Let's see. Is there, oh, we got the meeting room. Admit. Okay. Um, let's see. Anybody else got any announcements before I get on to the main event here? Nope. Alrighty then. Well, I am going to now introduce our speaker, which mostly usually just consists of me reading the bio the speaker provided me, and then I will turn things over to our speaker for this month. Um, our speaker this month is Alex Wyckoff. Um, this bio, I think, is up to date. I think I got the latest one. Alex can correct anything I say that is not currently up to date. But he is a product manager with a depth of experience from over a decade-long career, which has spanned QA, design, and product. His most recent role was product manager at Brave. That Side note, that might be part of why I was interested in having Alex speak with us. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Brave browser is a privacy-oriented browser, much like Firefox, that is trying to uh, disrupt traditional browser surveillance models uh, propagated by certain browsers you may have heard of, Cough, Chrome, Cough. Uh, anyway, um, his most recent role was a product manager at Brave, where he focused on rewards, a cryptocurrency token system which allows users to opt into privacy-preserving ads and support the creators they enjoy. Enjoy. He's a graduate of the Austin Center for Design and regular attendee at Hope and DEF CON. He just has a general affinity for privacy, security, technology, and the dialogue it forms with society and culture through its implementations. And in this talk, Alex is going to, um, what is my screen flashing about? Oh, David, just in the chat. And then in this talk, um, Alex is going to be covering the creation and execution of Distributed Camp, which was a three-day virtual conference he helped put together, which provided hands-on workshops for participants to explore IPFS, Beaker Browser, and the HyperCore Protocol, WebTorrent, and I2P. Uh, and if a lot of those are just acronyms and words that you don't know what they mean, and some of them are even that for me, then you're in the right place because Alex is going to tell us what all those things are, as well as just the exciting developments in people who are not happy with the increasingly centralized direction the web is going and how we can actually keep that early 90s utopian promise alive, although hopefully um, in a way that is empowering and you know, I mean, I would like to hear some solutions to how we don't centralize the web in a way that lets certain bad political actors pay money to control the narrative of who is important online, because I like to think everybody's important online. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Alex, and we're going to learn just what the hell these projects he works on are. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. So, uh, yeah. I, that was a perfectly good summary, um, and I'm going to try to cover at a high level distributed technology in the time of pandemic, um, very specifically what happened at Distributed Camp. Uh, things I'm not going to talk about, however, are things like distributed hash tables or the Catamelia, um, you know, uh, algorithm that's used by a lot of these kind of uh, organizations. Um, I've, there's a lot of like in-depth parts of the tech we're not gonna get so crazy about, but hopefully you'll walk away knowing a little bit more about the kind of projects that are out there and, uh, and how to host one of these events for yourself. So uh, who am I? I'm gonna, as an overview, I'm gonna talk about who I am. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief description of what distributed means in the context of all this. Um, we're gonna talk about the reasoning behind why distributed camp needed to exist and look at its initial creation. We'll look at some of the technologies that were used in the creation of the camp and then have a look at the outcomes. So who am I? 
I am the creator and organizer of Distributed Camp. Uh, this is everything that uh, Kevin told you, plus a little bit more. So I was a contributor to the Invisible Internet Project, that is I2P, that works as a uh, layer on top of the internet as we know it. It uses mixed nets and uh, really good encryption to route traffic differently and uh, with great in and, and with a great protection of privacy. It's a it's a peculiar project. It's very long lived. It's nearly two decades old at this point, and um, and it's very often held up as a alternative to Tor, although I think that they serve somewhat different roles. Uh, and then, of course, um, in my free time, I do sometimes do streaming on Twitch. And the last major push of streaming I did was all related to free and open source software and specifically design tools in that space. So what do I mean by distributed? I think that there's a lot of different ways that you could describe it, but and and I think that that kind of debate rages on quite often. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll kind of say that processing is shared across multiple nodes. That that could be computers of any type, uh, but the decisions are you know they could be centralized and they can use complete system knowledge. So it's independent nodes, optional centralization. I think that that's like a really nice way to like summarize what happens in that space. And what are the kind of problems that we look to address with this? Uh, we look at physical points of failure. It's physical structure. We look at too much control by a singular authority. That's social structure. We look at monopolistic practices, right? And that's economic structure. So, uh, and, and I very specifically call out the word structure in all of this because indeed, you know, this really does even come down to the wires that lead to data centers, you know, uh, but the, those things have ramifications in the rest of our society as well. So why distributed camp? I believe that these technologies, they are more consumer ready than, um, you know, a lot of people would give them credit. And the thing is that when we talk about distributed tech, a lot, a lot of the conversation goes towards coin projects and uh, perhaps not enough toward the actual act of creation on these systems. And so I felt that these projects needed a nudge to engage more publicly and to start to shift their core persona from fellow developers to the lay public. What happens when you're less concerned about how somebody is going to implement a, a front end for your API and you're more concerned about the person who wants to share photos or to create their own art of different types or do writing, right? Or their own journalism. So what about the pandemic? Uh, we're all stuck at home with exceptional amounts of personal time. And so if there's a time to make changes, this is it. And, you know, I joke about this sometimes on Twitter and whatnot, that this is a great time for the U.S. to finally switch all the signs over to the metric system and, uh, and for us to all get used to using UTC. But it is to say we are allowed to challenge things now. And there's not that, like, day-to-day -day momentum of habit that's holding us back. And so systems that you would use for vacations in the past, you can reevaluate those now. And then uh, this was something that Kevin alluded to earlier, and I can't believe it. I didn't share the slides with him ahead of this, but uh, you know, this is a real problem, right? That our public narratives are altered through these centralized systems and disinformation is rampant. And so we really do need these kind of systems that look at amplifying information and uh, have a chance at avoiding manipulation at, at their cores. So distributed camp, what is like the MVP version of distributed camp so that you could run off and do this by yourself right now? You just need people who are interested in technology and a means to communicate. And everything else beyond this that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk, you know, it, you could interchange it with almost any other form of technology and it's going to work, right? It does come down to people and their willingness to communicate. So let's take a little look at inspirations. Uh, we have to roll back the clock. And you know, if, you, if you look at what happened with Hackers on Planet Earth over this summer in particular, or DEF CON over this particular summer, 
you would walk away with a feeling like it was inevitable. But if you roll back the clock to March and April and May, when this conversation was just getting off the ground, uh, there wasn't really a roadmap or a really well-defined means of creating virtual events. They existed here and there. There's online meetups, but nobody really was doing weekend long events even. So uh, I looked at a few different things. IDEO did a really great job for a multiple hour event and it was a workshop that involved Zoom and Figma and they had all of this great thinking and ideation happening in a very short period of time. Hackers on planet Earth uh, have been doing online uh, rebroadcasting of their events and they've, and they've been doing this for years at this point. I'm very thankful as somebody who moved down to Texas in 2012 that they started doing that um, because it makes it's a lot easier than trying to fly up to New York. Uh, I've only managed to do it once since I moved down here. The rest of the time I've lived in Pennsylvania and it's an easy drive to New York from there. Bang Bang Con this year absolutely did the best. Uh, out of every event that I've ever been to, Bang Bang Con has been absolutely phenomenal about making this transition into an online event, but still maintaining aspects of community. And the one thing that I felt like they did outrageously well is what we would otherwise call in conference organizing as the hallway track. That is, outside of the main scheduled speakers, how do you create the conditions that allow for serendipitous communication between participants and allow them to like make those connections and, and uh, you know, foster bonds? Um, and then in terms of the physical, I was inspired by Bond, which was uh, an event similar to XOXO. It's actually organized, um, Backerkit sponsored it, but it was organized by the same folks that do XOXO. And, uh, and then of course the, the bar camp and product camp on conferences. Uh, I've, I've attended both in the past. I felt like they were really informative in terms of how can you structure speakers, but still have serendipity. So what were some of the core motivations that I had with the distributed camp? Number one is a big tent. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of projects that exist out there in this space. And, um, and if, especially if you look in the coin space of all of this, they tend to have a very zero sum mentality that for them to win out, the other coin projects have to lose. And I think that we can all think of one coin in particular that acts that way uh, even more than the rest. And what I didn't want to have is to have too much infighting on the projects that participated in this camp. I wanted them to have a, a broader mind to say it's possible to create content and, and to participate in a, in a variety of ecosystems and that they all have value, that it's not zero sum in this sense. The, truly what we're trying to do is move away from um, what Paul Frazee would call the legacy web. And thank goodness Paul's here on this call and I'm going to count on him later on in the talk. Um, but it is to say that the movement is one where the tide will lift all boats. And in any movement away from the legacy web is a move in the right direction. So uh, the other things that I wanted to look at here were keep it user-centered. And what I mean by user-centered, again, is to not fo focus so explicitly on developer as a user persona, but rather to look at end user. Who are the people that are going to consume content who are the people that are going to create content? And, and to also look at what can be done to make creation easy. Lastly, uh, a thought that we're all participants. I am not a big fan of exceptional hierarchies and I wanted to make sure that everybody felt like they had a chance to get as hands-on as humanly possible. So let's just take a quick look at the technology stack. Um, in terms of the content itself, I used Hugo and DigitalOcean, and uh, if you're not familiar with those, Hugo is a static site generator, and DigitalOcean is just a cloud service provider. And uh, Zoom and OBS, Zoom is of course what we're using right now for this call, but OBS, if you haven't heard about it before, it's a tool that's used to, it's called Open Broadcast Software, and it's a tool that's used by streamers to take whatever video and audio is happening on their systems and to rebroadcast it, whether that's on YouTube or on Twitch or et cetera. 
Discord uh, is a chat system. It's pretty similar to IRC, plus a few bells and whistles. Uh, and then lastly, WebTorrent for replay and distribution. And WebTorrent in particular was like a late add-on. So I wanted to talk, uh, you know, before I get, dive in a little bit deeper on each of those technologies, I wanted to talk about what were the communications that kicked this all off. And so uh, in March, the very first communication that happened was a DM. And uh, this was on Twitter. And I said, hey, you know, I don't know if other distributed folks are, are talking about this yet, but there's a lot of events that are getting canceled, right? This is early stage COVID. We didn't know that everything was going to get canceled. And even then, at that point, South by Southwest was still up in the air. And, um, and, and so what I said was, this would be a really great time to do what I call a distributed conference about distributed tech. That is like a not, for, a not physical thing. And, and then, you know, their first reply was, yeah, that's a good idea. I go and talk to another person that I know. And I was like, in the middle of a conversation, I just kind of slide it in. And I was like, hey, I've got something fun for you. And, uh, and so it looks like these conferences are closing up. And we were looking at that point in time. It was like, yeah, hope was on the rocks, DEF CON on the rocks. We're not sure what's gonna happen, right? Um, and, I, and then I mentioned, I talked to this creator and they're open to doing this distributed web conference remote. And they're like, oh, great. So they're both on board. So then uh, I talked to this third person just a few days later. And I was like, I was working with them through Brave at the time. And, uh, and I wanted to ask them something outside of work. So again, a DM on Twitter. And, uh, and I said, hey, I'm organizing this virtual conference. At this point in time, like projects A and B were, were pretty much on board. It was, it was pretty much a lock. And, uh, and I was like, here's, you know, and we even started to talk about structure. Like, what do we want to do? We want to have a one hour talk. And then we want to have like a two to three hour workshop. Because I wanted to give people lots of mental space to be able to build something and not just like ram, ram, ram on presentations. So uh, I put this out there and I was like, hey, you know, would you, you think you'd like to try this out with this, pro this other project you're working on? And uh, we're looking at like maybe like the end of May, like mid to late May, right? They, their response was actually kind of lukewarm. They're like, I don't know, what's the commitment like? You know, they, this person had a, already a lot of stuff on their plate and so they weren't sure. But moments later, uh, I casually mentioned, you know, I want to reach out to this uh, last project. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know the CEO of that project. I'll introduce you. <laughs> so even though they're kind of lukewarm about their own, you know, participation, they totally went to bat for me and, and they made this set of introductions and, and that closed up the last of the projects for the weekend. And uh, I, I call this all out so that you know that it wasn't anything super formal. It, you know, I didn't have like large written proposals and, and, you know, deep thoughts. This, this was just casual DMs and just like, hey, what do you think about this? Could this work? And, uh, and everybody was just amazing at saying, yeah, let's give it a try. So now we'll kind of backtrack to the technologies. So why Hugo? Uh, and, you know, Hugo itself is a static site generator. And what that means is that you don't need to rely on um, it being a live site. Like if you use Ruby Rails or Elixir and Phoenix or even Node, it's just you have flat files and they exist out there and, and that's what you get. And, uh, and the reason why I used that in particular was that I looked at each of these participating technologies. I, I looked at I2P. And they have a web server that's called Jetty. And uh, Beaker Browser has their hypercore and the ability to, their hyperdrive and their ability to, to host files. And then also IPFS, of course, has their ability to host files. And, and so three out of the four were like a pretty good fit for this thing. Because if you have a static site and you have your locally hosted references, then you don't have to reach out to the legacy web because anytime you have uh, those kind of systems where you have to like reach out and then try and like hit a CDN to get a JavaScript library or something like this, that those, those kind of like rough edges between these distributed systems and the legacy web, that's, that's where things tend to fall apart. So if I could create self-contained web, a self-contained website for the camp, then I had the possibility to re-host it 
on these systems. And that was a very serious consideration. I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave them out or, or very intentionally point to legacy web as the means, the only means of, you know, egress, ingress to the system. And so I wanted to show, yeah, it's plausible. You know, I, we can just straight up use these systems right now. Next, uh, why zoom, zoom in OBS? So uh, before Kevin started recording, we talked a little bit about, you know, if you roll back the clock again and look at April, May, what existed in terms of video technology? And there's Jimmy and there's Jitsi, and they work okay up to about five folks or so. And, but even then, they require very often a dedicated server. And I'm running this whole event in my spare time for a $0 budget. And the last thing I want to do is to pile on another job of having to be like DevOps extraordinaire to try and spin up yet another server. So Zoom at that time uh, certainly had a lot of problems. The, they didn't have a good waiting room. They didn't have uh, particularly good password management. And uh, even today, it's probably questionable. Uh, Zoom bombings as a phenomenon were absolutely rampant. However, IDEO did just great and they didn't get Zoom bombed. And Hope has shown before that it's possible to rebroadcast your, your conferences live. And then Bang Bang Con did also a superb job using Zoom. And then, and then what they did is they forwarded it to YouTube. So I saw that it's possible. And what I ended up doing is I ended up just copying and pasting the Bang Bang Con method. Uh, but instead of going to YouTube, I went to Twitch. And the reason why was I was so afraid of people Zoom bombing uh, that I wanted a way to broadcast what the speaker had to say, but have like no risk whatsoever to them being interrupted. So why Discord? Uh, when I look at it, if, uh, if I would have chosen Slack as a, as a way to chat with folks, there's two major drawbacks. Number one is Slack is already what a lot of people use for work. And I didn't want anybody getting interrupted with casual work conversations in the middle of the camp. The point is that they should be able to like separate those things. And so I just in general don't think that Slack is a good answer for online events just because it, it is too professional in its use. Uh, the other thing is that Bang Bang Con again showed this really great way to utilize Discord for the hallway track. And so they are able to create serendipitous connections between folks, although that ended up being not entirely necessary um, and for a different reason. There, it turned out that um, there was actually a new serendipitous tool that's come about that, um, that I'll, talk, I'll talk about at the tail end of the talk. So, Let's take a little look at what did we get out of this. For, the, for just that little stack of technology, we ended up getting nine major talks. And, and these projects, in my opinion, are not small projects. So the Invisible Internet Project has been around for nearly 20 years. The Beaker browser is fantastic. And as far as browsers that are focused in this space, they are bar none the best. They are, they are absolutely in the space of facilitating creation and not just for developers as the main persona. IPFS also absolutely massive and, uh, and very, very hard to beat. And then a lot of these projects for the next set there kind of fall under their umbrella. The EDGI was actually not a software project, but, uh, but they're an advocacy group for data integrity. And, um, and they were actually talking about the core mechanics, but then they also related it to uh, the, what's the actual social impact of, of technologies like IPFS and, and, uh, and the hypercore protocol and, and ITP. What happens when you can store data reliably for an extended period of time? And they actually related it back to the notion of sensor readings and, and the liability that uh, petrochemical companies would have for leaks and, and that they would be able to, you can't see the, ref, the effects of that so immediately, but if people were to get cancer, say a decade or two decades later, they could point back to that and say, well, actually we have the sensor readings that showed you've been leaking for such an extended period of time and you know, it's carcinogenic, et cetera. Uh, and that would actually lead to an effective lawsuit. So I thought that was utterly fascinating. Filecoin, uh, of course, is forward-looking in terms of 
the ability to distribute some of that cloud computing aspect. If you look at like what S3 does on AWS, um, and then Fleet, Pinata, and Textile all have to do with different aspects of deploying and um, marking content that exists out on IPFS. And then last but not least, WebTorrent. Um, so for us, did an amazing job of sharing the structure of torrents and how they work and how to use them effectively for communications. And, uh, and so that was really fantastic. We overall got 300 signups and we averaged 30 to 40 viewers per talk. And you might not think that that's a lot, but if you look at some of the other conferences that have occurred, you actually get really similar numbers. And the only time that they go up is because if you try to compare against like Hope or DEF CON, how long have they been around and how much are they established, right? Again, I, you know, this is all done for zero dollars. <laughs> and, and inside of the span of, as you saw from the communications there, two, almost two and a half months. So how did people feel about it? 76% of the campers said that they would purchase a ticket or donate funds for the next event. And, and that's pretty wild to think that that many folks said, yes, I had that good of a time at this camp that I would pay for it next time. And then 92% approval rating and net promoter score. There's two separate questions. One of them was, how did you feel about the camp overall, good, bad, or indifferent? 92% said it was great. And in a separate question, how likely are you to recommend this camp to your friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, et cetera? And 92% said, absolutely, I would. So that was really fantastic. So what do we take away as room for improvements? Uh, don't use Google Forms for event registration. And I think most of the folks on this call would probably say, don't use Google ever. But it was, it, you know, I was too worried about trolls. Uh, there was so much going on, like I said, about the Zoom bombings and whatnot at that time that I was just deathly afraid of creating an event and that all that it did was promote bad actors and, and give them a space. What I wanted so badly in my heart was for folks to be able to come together and enjoy these technologies and try them out for themselves. And so uh, I think the things that I could have done better is I certainly could have and should have promoted across more channels, whether that's Y Combinator or Reddit or, you know, any other place, the BFF, of course, but uh, just to get the word out as much as possible and longer ahead of the event. And then the other thing was I should have pushed harder for sponsors. So, you know, the one thing that I missed out on all of this is I wanted to have folks participate who were not technologists by trade. And specifically, I was really hoping to get input from the design community and looking most especially at people who are in the space of anthropology. And um, one person in particular, Genevieve Bell, is somebody I think of a lot when I think about this. But I wanted them to bring their perspective in, to look at these technologies, look at where people are pushing them, and to think about what's the impact of society. And I think that it, you know, if I could do anything different, I would have loved to have raised the funds necessary. Uh, it was, I was very, very lucky that, that there was one person who is an ethnographer by trade and, uh, and I was able to get on a call with her and, and she was so very helpful and, and she was just honest and, and laid it out flat and said, Alex, you know, on the circuit, it's pretty common to like be pulling in somewhere between 10 and $20,000 for a talk. And, um, and there, and this is a person who's very well regarded and they're like, if you're trying to get these kind of people to show up, that's the kind of money you have to put out there. And so they're, they're like, unless they're like your best friend, <laughs> you know, and they're, and they're doing you some kind of ultimate favor, uh, chances are you're going to have to put something out there like that. So in the future, if I could find sponsors so that it could offset the cost of having those kind of people show up as presenters, it would be really fantastic. And then last but certainly not least, keep pushing for diverse presenters. We were good in that we had female presenters and presenters who were people of color, but not nearly enough in both cases. So, you know, that's just something to keep pushing for and to keep improving to make sure that we're bringing a lot of voices out there and, and to have that representation. 
So my closing thought on all this is that if I could do this for a zero dollar budget and in my spare time after work, all of you could absolutely do better. And so please replicate this and improve it. I, I looked to the bar camp example. I looked to the product camp example that um, this, is, this is not a branded thing. I don't have a copyright on any of this. I would so very much like to see you all take the spirit of this and carry it forward and to create your own events and to spread that enthusiasm for these technologies. Thank you. And if there's any questions, um, I'll take them. Well, thank you very much for the quick overview there. I'm sure we'll have a few questions for you. Um, yeah, who's got a question for Alex? <laughs> And I can uh, go if nobody does. And since I know half of you, I may call certain people out by name if they don't volunteer. Oh, well, Azan just gives us a question here in the chat. Um, he asked, I'm most curious about the Beaker browser. Did anyone make anything with that? So uh, we're very, very lucky to have the creator of the Beaker browser on the call here. <laughs> and so, Paul, if, if you wouldn't mind, maybe I'll, I'll let you kind of uh pop in if you want to say something about that and uh, uh as i was just saying oh shit neato to that so i think you may have made his day <laughs> uh yeah i don't remember honestly alex i don't remember because um we are like still in a <clears throat> really intensive beta period so oh yeah no there was the um the video game that one person made it was really cool um mm -hmm. i think he ended up calling it fellows and <clears throat> we have this um, web API that's a sort of a low rent um, synchronous messaging channel that actually needs a little bit of work, but he was able to kind of leverage that to create like a, a live chat where you would have an avatar that could walk around on a map and see the other avatars and, and chat and have little chat bubbles pop up above their heads, uh, which was a really fantastic project that ended up kind of revealing more bugs than, <laughs> than uh, <laughs> managing to fulfill what he was going for. But uh, yeah, that and uh, there were a couple of neat chat rooms that were made in the browser as well as some nice forks of the social sort of um, Twitter uh, clone were being worked on at the time. And so a lot of, a lot of that kind of got a nice kick up from the event. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the other ones that stand out for me were, um, I think that somebody was able to get a version of WebTorrent up and running inside of there pretty quickly, <laughs> that they had a WebTorrent player up and running. And like, it was really a copy and paste the code. And it, it was just a matter of the editor button, which is like right there in the UI. They just like popped it open on their, on their homepage, copied and pasted the code in and it just worked. And so that was one that stood out for me. I think the other one that stood out for me was there's a social connection mechanism as well that you have this ability to have uh, like an address book of sorts. And, and it was like this one button, like here, join, you know, connect with me and, and let's get added on each other's address books, which for uh, social discovery, I think is a, a really important aspect of these systems and, and to make them work effectively. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I'll say that I only am very lightly familiar with Beaker Browser. I've not had a chance to play around with it yet. I, I guess I'm just curious, of, and this is me being technical, but I gather since I believe it's a Chromium spinoff, would it be correct to say it's basically, is there like an instance of like Node that's just bundled in the browser used to serve these things basically? Uh, I'm from nodding. I'm guessing yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, we're we're using Electron, you know. So right, right. Helps us, yeah, helps us move really quickly. And the the Hypercore protocol stack is all written in Node, and so it ended up being a, a pretty ideal marriage there. Um, yeah, that's how it functions. And uh, what's what's the process of like finding other uh, other nodes in the network or other people hosting their own servers or instances? Do you have to know an email address or an IP address, or I'm curious how easy, hard the search functionality to traverse the graph is. Yeah, the um, you know that really operates on two different levels. You have the um, connection layer for um, accessing content in general, which leverages a DHT, um, which is used uh, purely to help you whenever you're visiting a, a given site to find the hosting peers and, and access the data. But then you have a layer uh, above that, which would be the social layer and social discovery. And um, and the next release, which is uh, being worked on, um, should be the 1.0 final, taking us out of beta. We've spent a little bit of time um, 
helping kind of improve that address book that Alex mentioned so that not only do you <clears throat> have a consistent way of declaring social relationships so you can subscribe to somebody, it'll be published in a, in a record, thereby creating a graph, um, but we're also beginning to leverage distributed secondary indexes so that um, you can subscribe to these indexes and, and see when somebody that you're not connected to will subscribe to you, get a notification about that, and that'll help facilitate the social discovery. And, and how, like, does the graph facilitate uh, levels of privacy? Like, for instance, can I only publish my Beaker Browser website to a subset of the graph, or is everything public on the whole graph? Uh, currently, there's only two modes of, of um, privacy, the 100% um, public um, <laughs> and, or, you know, public, but perhaps, you know, maybe somebody, nobody's looking at it, so it may be kind of private in that regard, um, or 100% private and kept offline. And um, we intend to expand upon that with um, sort of uh, a, a group system which allows you to have drives which are um, whitelisting IPs and um, kind of set up a, a collection of people that are meant to access it and things like that. So, but it, for, for probably a, the foreseeable six months, it'll still be this kind of bimodal, totally private or totally public. Gotcha. I mean, I, I do see the. But I get potentially excited about this with those future directions because it really promises to potentially allow an internet that really has granular privacy of like naturally different communities of sharing just built into the protocol, which would be like the holy grail of that could ever actually take off. Um, yeah. Very exciting stuff. Um, can can um, people who are on non-Beaker browsers get to Beaker browser hosted websites or are, do other browsers, are they not able to see the, uh, the, the protocols involved? So if you're talking about native protocol access, uh, the other browsers are not able to, there's somebody in the community working on a mobile browser um, and doing really pretty good work on that. That's called Gateway. So keep it half an eye out for that. We, we promote everything that they do. So you know, does it, watch us, does it still know. utilize um, normal <laughs> DNS calls to do human readable lookups or is it using its own stuff? We're actually right in the middle of talking about that. Uh, in fact, Alex, you recently, uh, somebody posted some uh, of our uh, URLs, which are using 64 character hex keys for the domain right now, which is, you know, ugly garbage. And uh, uh, Alex very rightly quote retweeted that. I was like, this is, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely one of those things where <laughs> when I think about the similar parallel movement of the people working on indie web stuff, I'm like, mm -hmm. this is great. I love all of it. How do we get it to the point it's as easy as using Facebook? Because we won't slay the right. dragon until it's as easy as using Facebook. <laughs> I completely agree about that. And we're, we're trying to leverage um, search to um, a, a fair degree to, to help um, remove some of the importance of, of uh, you know, DNS mappings or short names, um, which uh, has its own limits. But at this at present, our secondary index that you subscribe to can't handle FTS. And so that's just a, a local search where anybody that you're subscribed to, you ingest. So if they're publishing records, you can search off of that. Um, so that will help, um, but uh, we're actually, uh, as I was saying off of Alex's uh, tweet, we've been kind of talking about leveraging existing DNS using TXT records, which is uh, fine. We'll probably still do that, um, but we're also talking about doing something similar to what ITP does, which is having um, a new name system in which you install um, a locally address books and um, thereby not have uh, globality to the system of naming, um, unless, you know, except for a kind of a social consensus. So, um, so almost name spaces for the naming system, basically. Yeah, and a, you know, a kind of non-global namespace, which will probably still be using a hierarchy like existing DNS does, so you'd essentially be installing new root TLDs um, using this alternative DNS, and, uh, uh, you know, as a result, um, you end up with questions about like, okay, what happens if you don't have the uh, uh, registry, the names registry installed, or if you have a conflicting one installed, and um, that just becomes a sort of a social thing that you, if it's a 404, you're going to maybe search around, see if anybody's installed a, a registry by that name. You know, there are a little bit of complications to the, to the user installable uh, short names, but uh, probably not so bad that it makes it a low, you know, not a valuable feature to have. Right. And um, so... 
And I, I just look forward to once again the project experimenting with alternatives because it seems like half the soft censorship of the internet comes from governments exploiting DNS lookups. So if we could get a better right. system, that that would be good. <laughs> yeah, and I actually think we can get better privacy characteristics on DNS lookups and on our alternative system because um, not only will the traffic be encrypted, but you can optimistically sync the the address book. Uh, and so your lookups will be off of a, a local cache and you won't be revealing anything to the network. So there's um, some definite upsides that you can get off of uh, custom DNS. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's just very exciting. I mean, and it, 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 it harkens to, it's just going to be cool potentially eventually to have a world where like creating and sharing websites and contents is as easy as browsing the internet and with no intermediary, like, that, yeah. that I, I'm just really thrilled that uh, people are doing this stuff, particularly because it just answers a lot of my own frustrations where it's like, oh, why do I got to spin up my own server if I want to do anything? It's like the web always feels harder than it needs to be. And it's like, well, it's that way just because that's how we've all been doing it forever. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's two perspectives about that. One of them is that like DevOps is just an enormous burden. And um, if it's if you have to do DevOps, that means that the average user is not going to be able to do it. In fact, most sophisticated users will avoid doing things as uh, self-hosting related just on account of the DevOps cost. Um, so eliminating DevOps is a, a huge um, upside to this kind of um, system. Um, but another kind of um, way that I like to, to talk about this is in terms of just uh, beginning to bake core functionality of what we do on the web into the actual web platform so that that infrastructure is actually infrastructure. You know, so publishing websites, connecting socially and things like that, that should just be part of the web platform as opposed to being a portal to somebody else's platform. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, who else has questions? I don't want this to just be the me show. <laughs> I see our board member John joined us here. Uh, does John, John usually has smart things to say. Does John have any questions? You're muted if you want to say something. <laughs> no, I don't really have any questions. <clears throat> um, Just here I, to join us. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to hear everybody's jamming. I don't have any questions partly because I totally ditched on it and showed up right <laughs> at the end of the presentation. But I will say that last slide was very pleasant. I mean, I mean, you know, if, if this, I'll just say, John, if, if this, these projects continue to take off, much like the stuff with IndieWeb, I'm just going to say, maybe we can finally uh, realize our dream of continuing to be able to chat with you, but not have to have Facebook involved in the recipe. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Well, you know, Facebook doesn't have to be involved necessarily anyway. It's just that we're all there. Well, right. And, you know, I mean, I'm, and sometimes I just think it's interesting to run the social experiments on Facebook. As I alluded to earlier, we're actually running a bit of an experiment of, well, actually, how much is this so called mythical advertising Facebook claims that it offers you worth? We're like, oh, uh, well, let's see if we can get signatures for our facial recognition petition using Facebook's wizardry. And the initial results are, yeah, it'll get me some signatures, but it's not a very good value for the money. So interesting. Uh, a huge number of signatures. Well, so um, since we're in this territory, and this is kind of off topic, but I just want to, I'll quickly mention that uh, um, Corey Dockrow wrote something recently on 1-0 uh, about surveillance capitalism. Uh, if you want to look that up, it's like a book, really. Oh yeah, how um, to destroy surveillance capitalism. It's I haven't finished it yet, but to everybody in well, this but the room, main point of that is yeah. is the, the problem that we're confronting now is monopoly. Mm -hmm. Facebook has a monopoly on network effect in a, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a pretty good argument for not just breaking up Facebook's uh, monopoly on various kinds of tech applications and platforms, but on the data itself. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of like separating the, the data from the platform so that it could be used by anyone so that you guys could use it in what you're building. You right. Know? That I don't have, or, or they could use it or like that we don't have to go through Facebook to find data on people who might be interested in our issues, et cetera. Absolutely. You know, the, Public domain data, exactly. 
No, I mean, it. Uh, it's a good read. I recommend it to everybody in this room. I've been enjoying it greatly. It, uh, and I, I also commend Corey for giving a strong building and rebuttal to some of uh, Shosana Zubas' thoughts in surveillance capitalism. He does, and, and it's a masterclass in disagreeing with somebody respectfully. He clearly has a lot of admiration for Shoshana, but he is of the opinion that, uh, no, uh, Facebook does not have a magic mind control ray. They have a monopoly. <laughs> Well, they may have a magic mind control, Ray, but that's not the thing that he was discussing at the time. Well, they, so, they may for all I know. I don't know. <laughs> he said that the things that she talked about were not uh, the magic mind control, Ray. Right. But I don't know that that completely disputes the possibility that Facebook does have a mind control, Ray. Well, I mean, I was literally this going is something down. We should consider. I mean, I was literally today going down the rabbit's hole of billionaire philanthropy and looking into the things the Zuckerberg Initiative funds to launder their uh, uh, ill-gotten gains. It, it's, I could believe Zuck has anything hidden back there, frankly. <laughs> there you go. Okay, uh, I'll shut up. Okay, well, I'm glad we still heard from you, John. Um, we got uh, some other questions for Alex here. I may awkwardly call people I know out if we don't get other questions. Um, who has a I question? actually have a question for the crowd, if I could. Oh, okay. And if nobody answers it, I will. But as I said, sure. I may call on you if you don't. <laughs> so the question for the crowd goes like this. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that the participating technologies were the Invisible Internet Project the Beaker browser, of course, uh, IPFS and WebTorrent. And I was curious, out of the folks that are on this call, has anybody actually used any of those technologies before this call? That's the first question. And then I think the follow-up question is, having seen my presentation, uh, are you any more likely to try any of those technologies, say, within the next week? Um, I'll, I'll kick that off and then we can hand it off. Um, the answer would be, I've mostly not used your technology stack. The closest I've probably come is I've played around a little bit with the Tor browser. So that gets me a bit close to I2P. Um, that's because it's an adjacent project. I've not used most of these things though. I mean, frankly, actually, uh, I think, I mean, frankly, the, the, some of the ideas Beaker's exploring as a software developer really excite me. I may at least give it a download and take a look at it. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of the things you talk about. Like I've heard of the interplanetary file system and I think I've, I think I have some friends like Brandon Wiley who have used it, but um, I've yet to get around to playing with it myself. Frankly, when I was a, a young, ne'er-do-well cyberpunk hacker college student, I had more time for this sort of thing. I have to earn my respectability paycheck these days. <laughs> but it, it's all very interesting stuff. I definitely want to check some more of it out and oh paul is saying yes to those like me who think beaker sounds very interesting wait for the 1.0 non-beta release uh that will be about two to four weeks get a lot more tooling will do just as well i pretty much don't have a life until the election's over because i work for an election software company so i'm not busy at all <laughs> uh Alex's question, uh, which also thank you, by the way, for giving the presentation. Um, uh, I, I tried the Beaker browser and I was very interested in it just kind of like, honestly, from like a cheapskate perspective, because it seems like a really interesting way of like not paying for hosting as much, you know, like being able to distribute your information and bandwidth. And uh, there's a lot of times where it sort of seems like, you know, why, why have all these, why have, you know, why well, have a copy of a file that I have to go to that's on the other side of America to get when my friend is also visiting the exact same website. It just seems to kind of like make sense to me as a progression of the internet. So, um, but I haven't done anything with it other than try it. So. I, I will say, and I will commend that Beaker sounds a lot less intimidating to jump on board with than getting uh, on the indie web thing, which I've played with a little bit and we're friends with some of the people here in Austin who work on the indie web project. I even put in a indie web WordPress plugin to the EFF Austin website, though it may be broken at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if they've kept that plugin up to date, but that one, you know, uh, uh, you know, it approached levels of like programming geekery in your spare time that was a little too big of a lift for me. Uh, God bless people like Tom Brown. Um, but yeah, so this the Beaker strikes me as a little more accessible, 
but still getting me to that wonderful peer-to-peer -peer decentralized world. Uh, John just asked in chat, does anybody have a good pointer to the uh, solid project, which Aslan also raised in the chat? I mean, I don't have anything other than going directly to their site and just telling you in general, it's Tim Berners-Lee trying to save the internet with his own version of a distributed internet. I have not heavily delved into the details. I, when I was between jobs, looked to see if they had job openings, but that was about the extent of it. <laughs> I think it's also primarily data, right? It's, it's, it's not so much distributed. I mean, I guess it's distributed internet in a broad sense, right? But it's not so much distributed websites as it's like, uh, like a profile is my understanding, right? Kind of. I mean, my understanding, yeah. If I recall, it's, bit, it's similar to he's not really trying to solve websites or social media peer-to-peer. -peer. He's more trying to solve data peer-to-peer -peer or digital identity peer-to-peer, -peer, which is also a worthy problem to solve. Anything that can get these megacorps out of the way of mediating the rest of us talking to each other in anything, the better. But yeah, I think it's more about your personal data trail online and that you would own it and potentially could rent out use of it to people and actually get reimbursed. You know, the, the Andrew Yang solution to the problem, which is better than what we have now, though I think people like Cory Doctorow also point out that that is not in and of itself a solution to all our problems. Uh, data is, has negative externalities when it is aggregated in large quantities independent of consent to sell it. <laughs> Um, Paul says he has a question for Alex about I2P. Just go ahead and ask it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, this is a personal question I had, <clears throat> which I think the answer might be interesting to folks in general. And Alex, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, could you talk a little bit about what are the differences between Tor and I2P? I, I mm -hmm. spent a little bit of time looking at their material and didn't walk away feeling totally educated. So yeah, what can you say about that? Yeah, sure. I'd, and, I'd appreciate a little more explication on that as well. I'll, I'll do my best to keep it um, to, to keep it closer to ELI five. Uh, <laughs> appreciate and, and, appreciate yeah. that subreddit reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Tor primarily concerns itself with web browsing, uh, and and with the intention toward obfuscating the the directionality of that connection between client and server, and. Um, and that, but it, but it is primarily web, and so you know, you, you have circuits, and circuits are, uh, in an abstract sense, uh, those hops that you make between, say, your web browser, and that, and and then, what is ultimately the Tor proxy out, and then the server you reach on the far side. So if you're trying to connect to Facebook, and you don't necessarily want them knowing that you're coming from Austin, Texas or specifically your IP address inside of Austin, Texas, you could use Tor and it will, you know, pinball you toward that connection and the way back, okay? And uh, the Invisible Internet Project, I2P, what it does differently is it is a mixed net, which uh, it still has this notion of circuits, but uh, it does a bit more. And it aims itself a little bit more for the UDP side of things. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, TCP and UDP are these major protocols that are used for moving bits about on the internet. One of them really cares a lot about the order in which they arrive, and that's TCP. It's like, I better get every single thing that you told me you're gonna give me, and it's gonna be in order. And UDP is kind of like, well, it might make it over there, I don't know. <laughs> it's a little bit more fast and loose. And, uh, and so uh, the Invisible Internet Project is a little bit more on the UDP side of things, which is good and bad. But what it does considerably differently is it, for those different hops along the way, that pinballing in the circuit, uh, it encrypts again and again and again, but also it mixes with each node along the way. And what I mean by that is that there's plenty of other traffic coming over the wire. And so what will happen is your packet of data, that is you requesting some uh, image from a forum, is going to get bundled up with somebody else's request for a certain portion of a web torrent, as well as somebody else's portion of an MP3. And that all gets bundled up and encrypted and sent along to the next node together. 
And so it makes it so that that backwards movement, that backwards observation through the circuit to try and figure out the origin becomes impossible. Uh, or, or, or so computationally complex that it doesn't merit attempt. And so um, that is a, a big difference because Tor is, you know, and, and most of the people in the Tor project prob uh, up, up until say last year <laughs> would, would probably agree with this next statement. Uh, it's not really meant for large file services like WebTorrent. Whereas I2P is absolutely meant for large file services because every single packet it breaks into, breaks up to, becomes cover traffic for everybody else on the network. That you, by doing anything on the network, you're creating noise that co helps cover for other participants on that network. And they have a built-in WebTorrent client. So you're totally meant to do big file transfers. And so, so that's I, why... Sorry, sorry. Oh, so just to say that um, if you had, like, say, an update service, you wouldn't run your update service over Tor. They would ask you, please don't do that. That's way too much load for our servers. We really just only care about web. We want people to be talking on websites. That's, that's kind of their goal. It's very communications-based on websites. ITP, on the other hand, would be like, absolutely run your update service on top of us because the more the merrier, give us all that noise. We love it. I guess my question would be, um, so yeah, I mean, I2P sounds miraculously censorship proof. Um, what, what are its downsides? I can't believe it's just like perfect and nothing's bad about it. You sort of alluded to it with UDP, which means mm -hmm. to me what some of the downsides might be, but why, why is it not the magic bullet of nobody can censor anything on the internet or know who's talking to who? You know, um, I think that the, the problem at this point is obscurity. Uh, that's one big problem. I think the other big problem, and ITP core maintainers will disagree with me about this, is the dependence upon certain forms of uh, software version control, and namely I'll call out monotone. I feel like that it, if you've never heard about that before, don't feel bad because it hasn't had documentation updates since 2011. And... Um, and I think that that holds back a lot of participation from developers who would improve the protocol or add features to the, um, the uh, pardon me, the router console. That there are aspects of ITP that are actually really hard to maintain. And one thing is that you have to stand up this router and it has to continuously run in the background to keep its relevancy on the network such that it can easily create circuits. If you try to like just shut it down and then open it back up again, it could be upwards of like 25 minutes before you have really good connections with other people because you reestablish all of your peers all over again for every shutdown. So it has to be long lived mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of the router console. Um, and then I think the bigger problem is really obscurity that it's like there's not nearly enough participants in the system to facilitate bandwidth such that people would feel really awesome. You, your, most of your websites are going to be pretty lightweight in terms of what they're doing because you're going to have some very constrained nodes along the way. It does its best to find you the most optimal nodes, but still. Like, so much, if, much like Tor, it, it has immense uh, speed issues. <laughs> yes. So you're going you're gonna to absolutely run into that. And, and you know, but arguably Beaker would have the same problem if there's a user that's in the most rural part of Pennsylvania using dial-up, you know, you're not going to have a fast connection with them, period. And well, right, I was going to say though, but I wouldn't be able to quickly talk to them, whatever we're using. They're the limiting factor. <laughs> right. So you but you get into situations like that where, but because it's a small, small, small network of people and you don't have like infinite amounts of content to look through, inevitably you're going to end up on one of those kind of servers that somebody who's running on their decades old Linux box and, you know, doesn't have like exactly the strongest connection to the network. 
And so, I, I also find myself wondering, uh, as my friend Brandon Wiley has told me when we're talking about internet censorship stuff, that most weird, bizarre forms of traffic have unique uh, visualization signatures that can make it pretty easy for, fine, you've magically encrypted things to the point that the uh, censors in the authoritarian regime have no idea who you're talking to or what you're talking about, but they know you're using that forbidden technology because its telltale signature is there in the data. I would imagine this problem probably has a somewhat telltale signature. Uh, I think that it's, if, if you look at it, it's encrypted UDP packets, which here, it, as far as I know, it doesn't have such a great signature relative to other projects. But it, it, and currently, as I understand it, it's more, again, a more of an obscurity problem than anything else. But here's what we hear. Here's, here's what the project hears, and I certainly heard it while I was contributing that uh, when, even when Tor is down in certain countries that um, have a certain a predilection for taking down services, um, ITP remains up. And so, you know, I think that there are certain situations where, you know, you can take down a whole big swath of the internet, but UDP don't care. So if you want to set those timeouts to infinity and beyond, it's still going to make it through. Right, um, so that's getting into the weeds a little bit about the mechanics of how packets move across the internet, but it is to say that um, it's fairly resilient and it's not gonna be, in, it's not gonna be any more obvious than VPNs. Uh, and you're gonna, at this point, certainly have more people using VPNs than even using I2P. So I think that it's it, the only, that's the bigger problem is that you have a higher risk of um, de-anonymization if only because it's obscure. Where, whereas the more popular it becomes, the less right. of a problem it's it is. one of those phenomenon until more people started using things like, you know, Signal, you know, it was like, oh, look, the one dude who has this weird signature, he's using Signal clearly. Right. And so it ends up leading into that kind of inevitable, inevitable philosophical argument, right? That if everybody were running it, then you wouldn't be able to use that as a heuristic. Right. So, you know, it's one of those things. Privacy is self-reinforcing. The, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the NSA can uh, break the encryption on the five people using encryption because they have yes. enough computing power that they can hit those five people. Everybody's right. doing it. There isn't enough computing power on earth to do it. That's right. And, and arguably, I, I think it's a very fair counter argument to all of this is to say that, um, you know, HTTPS everywhere and the uh, cert bot have done more for security and privacy in the past five years than, than what we've seen out of a lot of these projects for even longer periods of time. Uh, that the, te it, the team at EFF have put that together. It's amazing work. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. If you look at that adoption curve of HTTPS, when everybody else was paying for their own certs and having to manage that stuff by hand, the adoption rate was abysmal. But you, you set it up so that it's a script you install once and, and it's fire and forget. And from thereafter, you have an HTTPS site. The adoption rate, just it went straight vertical, you know? Uh, and, and now you have the vast majority of websites are, are encrypted through HTTPS. And that's a very reasonable form of encryption. Well, so, it, it, it reminds me of like, you know, now with, you know, an app like Signal, you know, it's trivial to have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encryption. I think back in the day when it was like, oh, I tried to stand up uh, using something like PGP because my nerd hacker friends were like, oh, yeah, use PGP. And I eventually gave up in frustration. I was just like you know what? I'm not like a secret agent. I don't have weeks to get this working. I just want mm -hmm. to talk to people. Oh, absolutely. And so now and, it's easy, you know. And, and, uh, and to point to the PGP example specifically, I happen to know two cryptographers who are working diligently on a replacement to PGP, and it's called AGE. And that's A-G-E. It stands for Actually Good Encryption. And, uh, and, there's, a, and there's a Rust implementation, which is RAGE, uh, R-A-G-E, but you could say RAGE. And, um, but RAGE is the one that's being built by a person who uh, up until recently was also a contributor on ITP as well. Nice. So, Maybe I can finally get my SMTP connections easily encrypted. That would be nice. <laughs> uh, so funny enough, there is a mail service that runs on, on ITP as well. 
and and it, and it runs in and out of ITP, which is oh. fascinating. Oh, really? Nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and oh, I'm I sorry, asked, Alex. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on one small thing that you brought up. The the traffic bundling is that to resist against uh, statistical traffic analysis? Is that what the purpose of that bundling is? I think that. Uh, it's a mix of things. One of it is that back in like 2002, it was a neat idea and, and yeah. philosophically possible. So why not try it? Right. Um, and then, yeah, I think that the idea is certainly to resist that ability to statistically analyze and say, you know, to, to take a look at metadata running through routes and, and yeah, say, you oh, can look at a packet size as it's moving through the network and be like, okay, that same 10 kilobytes just moved down that circuit. So you could de it that way. So, okay. so, that's, there's, that's so there's padding and there's mixing that help to alleviate yeah. those aspects. And then of course, the fact that it has encryption, 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 encryption. And then when right. it gets to the tail end, it goes pop, 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 only right. by the end recipient. These things are helpful. Um, I also got another question uh, from Aslan here, but he was curious if anyone has done anything with the scuttlebutt protocol. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul, tonight is your night. Yeah, I guess so. I was one of the co-founders of uh, the Secure Scuttlebutt Project. Um, you you keep blowing I... Aslan's mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Dominic Tard uh, created the protocol and I was the second person to join him on that. And so I had helped create the original um, applications and clients that uh, are now called Patchwork and no longer really resemble my work anymore, but they help kick things off. Um, so yeah, um, similar concept in a lot of ways to secure skull, but for anybody that's not familiar, it, it holds a lot of similarities with IPFS and, um, uh, and uh, the Hypercore protocol. Um, which is what Beaker uses. Um, they're all sort of BitTorrent peer-to-peer -peer, uh, systems, but the uh, Secure Scuttlebutt is really specifically geared towards a sort of a social media use case um, uh, in the sense that every user is represented by an append-only log of entries, which usually the default usage is to append messages. And so it's a broadcast form of messaging. Um, but of course, uh, an append-only log can be used to build many different kinds of uh, data structures. And so that's where the generality of the technology comes from. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if you have any other questions about the secure spell about it, I could um, happily answer them. I don't, I don't know if I have so much like specific questions as I'm just sort of like interested in seeing what kind of things are being done with Scuttlebutt because uh, so just some background, I'm a design technologist. So like I can like, ho I like know enough code to like annoy developers on GitHub basically. And like sometimes do code in my day to day work, but I'm by no means like a full developer, but like I, I find the Scuttlebutt protocol stuff very interesting. And, uh, from what I understand, like a technical level, it's like, it's a protocol. So it's a lot more flexible. It's used by a bunch of different projects and stuff. Um, and then like the closest analogy, not analogy, but the closest like uh, project that has like a similar kind of focus is like Mastodon and Mastodon's like taken off way more. Um, I think in part because very smart marketing, it's very clear, like, you know, it's, it's kind of dumb, but it's also kind of cute that instead of tweets, you have toots and like they have a little cute uh, guy and uh, I really want to try scuttlebutt stuff because as cool as I find Mastodon I really would like to see an alternative to Facebook and some of the projects that people are working on in this scuttlebutt community seem like they're more Facebook adjacent in their functionality um, but I haven't found one yet that I feel is like really usable and part, part, part of I guess why I'm kind of curious about it is like why I asked, did, some, has, did someone work on with Scuttlebutt is because I want, you know, I want the Scuttlebutt on Scuttlebutt. I want to like get onto, I want to try something like that. I would love to be able to say, hey, everybody in my, in my like tech art collective, like let's go, let's stop using Slack or let's stop using our Facebook group and let's like, start using our own Scuttlebutt thing. I can spit up a server and we can use that. Um, but I haven't seen anything yet that I feel like very confident about introducing to like any of my friends and I also don't even really understand how to like how one would get involved in as a designer if one wanted to like come in and be like, hey, I can help out with this. I know how to, I'm not just gonna draw a bunch of pictures of Photoshop. I can also do some styling and code and CSS and whatever. But uh, yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like, do you see 
What What do you think about like the future for these uh, these uh, projects? And like, see any that are like standing out, particularly in the UX department. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be biased in what I say here because uh, I'm, I'm participating actively. So I'll try to try to give an unbiased um, take on on this. But uh, I probably it's worth stating that one of the reasons I moved on from uh, Scuttlebutt and started working on uh, Beaker and using the HyperCore technology was uh, concerns about whether or not Secure Scuttlebutt could ever get over that usability hump. Um, and uh, some of that, a lot of that actually has to do with uh, some of the ways that the technology is structured, which um, uh, just struggles with um, getting to the point that um, I think it will be uh, convenient for people to use. You know, it's so important that you could have the average user sitting down being able to have a just works kind of experience. Um, and uh, I don't know if they have fixed this. I don't think they have, but at the time that I was involved, there was a very uh, obscure process for getting connected to people, which involved a topology of uh, federated services, which were not readily apparent to a user. And so whether or not you could connect to and download somebody's information was really hard to divine from the state of the system. So it's the kind of thing where I could give you my URL and you would not be able to load my, my uh, content because there's no routing system that's automated that will guarantee connectivity. Um, so just to kind of an example of, of how things um, end up being a little bit difficult there. The way that it has played out in practice is that these, um, this federated, what they call pubs, um, end up acting as kind of community locuses. And so you join into these pubs and that's how you end up getting connected is, is if you're a part of a pub, you tend to be connected to the other people in these, in these pubs. Um, and hopefully they've begun to emphasize that aspect of it more because that's a fairly intuitive way for people to get connected to each other. Um, you know, it functions in some ways similarly to how Mastodon has its, uh, you know, uh, server uh, metaphor. Um, the, uh, the technology is a little bit difficult to work with, um, but I do know that there's a pretty active community of people that are building different kinds of custom clients. And I think if you're looking for one of the better put together clients to get a sense about where it's at, uh, the Miniverse client is quite good. It's a mobile That's the one I tried, actually, because- uh, No good, huh? Uh, yeah, I, I, I had, uh, forget who the main developer on that is, but- Andre Stoltz. Yeah, so- uh, I actually like weirdly enough like took up a project he did for hype, the hyper term uh, uh, hyper terminal. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so like I met him randomly through that, and then and then found Miniverse, and and Miniverse looks from the outside very good, but uh, when I tried to get it working with a friend, uh, it did, we couldn't get we couldn't figure out how to get the like parts to yeah. connect. Yeah, that's kind of in line with what I was concerned about with it. So. Uh, I don't know if they will solve that or not. Uh, uh, Scuttlebutt is a very purist, anarchic uh, society of people. And um, uh, they just live that ethos through and through, and uh, for better or for worse. So um, the, one of the perspectives I've kind of felt about this uh, for quite some time is uh, that um, it's very important that you um, do solve these usability problems and make something that which could be adopted in a mainstream uh, way, because otherwise you're, you're not going to be able to have a positive effect on how technology functions at large. Um, and uh, I am rooting for a secure scuttlebutt all the way, and I hope that they do get there, but um, they are uh, very um, strongly um, adhered to their um, ideals, which I commend, but may not end up help them, helping them get to that end point. Cool, cool. Um, I guess I'm going to do my requisite, see if I can get some uh, of our other participants, see if they have any questions. Uh, I'll just call out since I know most of you, but I'll just be like, uh, we got any questions from uh, Scoop, John, David, Scott? Um, love to have uh, hear from all the voices in the chat if there's any questions. Well, there's John. Hola, hola. Got audio? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. I say, Alex, uh, thanks. I definitely feel like I level up a bit hearing you chasing twins around in the background throughout most of it, but caught a good, decent uh, refresher on some things that I haven't touched in a minute, really. I would say to your question earlier, Beaker Browser on my to-do, the I2P side of it, interestingly, comes up on the free NAS and true NAS appliances that stand up for people they're like hey i got a gel with this thing how do i make it work you know and granted that's like a little io cage scenario it's easy to set up for people so i think that's 
puts it on some people's radar where otherwise they wouldn't have seen it. Um, and then I guess going to the IPFS use case, uh, good new world order dot info, which is actually clad to red hat guy. Um, he has about 15 to 16 gigs of augs and other open source media. IPFS was the best way to start getting that off of Apache web servers. Otherwise for technical people who were capable of using IPFS to get it. So I would say that's the extent of the direct experience so far, but I think it'll become more relevant over time, specifically to everything you've said. So, well, thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to try and encourage everybody uh, to do it for real. Uh, if you don't do it inside of the next week, then if you're willing to try a thing out, it's going to be the, the first weekend in December. I haven't announced this out on the website yet, but the first weekend in December, we're going to look at doing one more hackathon. And this one's going to be a lot more game related. And so we'll look at using Phaser.js, which is a JavaScript library for playing games. It has a canvas and you can set up very simplistic games like Pong, or you can actually do really complicated games that look like Super Mario Brothers and then some. And, um, and so the goal with that is, is it possible to create social games that exist out on these systems? And, uh, and so hopefully everybody will have a chance. And if you want to do it on Beaker, do it on Beaker. If you want to do it on ITP, do it on ITP or et cetera. But um, the goal is for folks to make just as many of these games as you possibly can. And, uh, and I'm looking at systems like the Ludum Dare and, uh, and some of these other game jams, global game jam and et cetera, as, uh, as these models of how people are generating a ton of interest in libraries. Undoubtedly, if you look at Epic Games and you look at Unity, they have earned a lot of developer base because of these game jams. And so is it possible to do a similar thing with Phaser and with these systems? I'm really hopeful, I'm optimistic about it. And at the very least, it'll get people playing around with these technologies a little bit more, uh, especially if I can line up a few bounties between now and then. So uh, if folks are at all interested in pitching in as volunteers, not asking for a ton of hours or anything, but just to help, you know, put out some nudges for sponsors, boost some social media posts, and et cetera, that might just be enough to like get some people coming in at the door and saying, oh yeah, sure, I'll, I'll pitch in on a bounty. So let's try it for this technology. Let's try it for that technology and see if we can kind of boost these projects a little bit further. Oh, that sounds great, Alex. And yeah, feel free to message me via email or on Twitter, you know, if you want to follow up and I'm happy to spread around any information about that that you've got coming up. Oh, and I guess, um, by the way, this is an entirely EFF awesome related business, but I guess I'll just say, uh, John, while I have you here, um, I sent you a private message, but I, um, I, be, I emailed about our website issues to the email you told me, and I never heard back from anybody from webhosting.coop. I'd love to like follow up with getting our recovery email uh, changed at some point here. So Definitely. We can follow up right after this, actually. Okay, but sounds good. Thank you so much. I say, I, uh, I, I'm sure you're a very busy man, and as you just said, you got twins, so I'm no rush. Just uh, wanted to make sure we We put a fence that. around the property, so at least we don't have to worry about them running out in the Navasota anymore. You know, it's kind of a hustle uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, got, I mean, I got a new puppy, so I sympathize. <laughs> yeah, but you know, they're not twin quite the puppies. Same thing, but, uh, not quite the same thing, but well, the irony is, most of the folks on this meet have actually met them, co-op ventures. But nonetheless, yeah, it's it's quite the hoot. I was going to say to the SSL adoption uh, conversation earlier, the, the beauty of what I think happened is a lot of people realize that it didn't matter if you were doing extended validation or instant or the other tiers that were originally half the confusion became immaterial when the browsers stopped differentiating on them. Because in a lot of cases it was spoofed and other things were playing into what was being presented to the browser anyway. So it didn't really represent the security of things. So I guess between Sectigo, well, I mean prior Komodo and then Let's Encrypt now, and then of course Cloudflare, bless them, they pushed the effort quite a bit when they initially turned on the always on SSL for the first time. And I would say those three initiatives were the massive ramp up that it was in everyone's best interest. And the, the beauty of it all, I guess, to this conversation is it didn't take the end users doing anything. It's well, automagic. Right. It's, so. it's similar to how recently Firefox turned the HTTPS over DNS on automatically. And now that's all silently happening in the background. It's beautiful. 
Yeah, that would be, um, I would say the one other thing from the listening in earlier, the, the conversation on distributed DNS and not relying on public DNF, DNS infrastructure. It's interesting if you track some of the bad guys, specifically the bigger Moroccan spam rings and some of the group out of Brazil that do the nefarious things, they've always been using local host files to take that profile off the network entirely. Every host name that's pre-configured in a script or that's referenced within an application will always be an Etsy host because the last thing they're going to do is send a beacon out over 53 on either side of the stack, TCP or UDP. It's easy to capture. If you think about it, Paul Vixie, the guy who created cron jobs and DNS and half the bind stack from the start, he runs a company, Farsight Security. That's all they do is passively inspect DNS traffic and predict where attacks are about to go. So it's a, it's a busy data spectrum. Well, sure. I mean, just every time I hear yet again, oh, authoritarian regimes censored the internet by way of how did they do it? Oh, they just shut DNS down. The entire internet's still working. They just shut DNS down. Why are we doing it this way? <laughs> Now, if they adopted IPv6 and that was their main transport, that's a lot more difficult of a problem. The four octet thing is still okay for people to jot down if they really need to. But yeah, distributing host files via DHT, that'll be the new norm here. Exciting times, exciting times. Um, let's see, anybody else we want to hear from here and see if we got any more questions. Uh, David, Scoop, Scott, and I don't know Chris, but Chris, you're of course welcome to ask a question as well. But any of the remaining people got some questions for our speaker. It's fine if no, I can only ask politely. And you've all sat here through this talk uh, during the COVID times, which I'm always very appreciative of. I don't have any questions, but I, I am going to say, I'm, I am looking forward to seeing the, these, these things kind of grow you. I feel like they're a, uh, a better opportunity for communication and really taking advantage of what the internet has to offer instead of us just being stuck behind the same three interfaces. And plus, you know, I guess if, if I do have a question would be, you know, what, how can we kind of, what are the, the, I guess the most, like, what do you think would be the most drawing selling points of trying to get people to kind of migrate over, um, you know, and I've had a really strong theory about this, uh, and, and I've thought about it a lot in the context of I2P because it's so esoteric and out there. And, um, and, and I've since developed a, a pretty strong opinion about this. I think that the biggest thing that will draw an, an audience across platforms is, is content. And, uh, and I think the one that draws the most is baby pictures. It's, it sounds dumb when, I, when you say it straightforward like that, but I think it really is. If you look at it, it, it has to be because that's the intergenerational connection between humans. And so if you have the next protocol that will, that will end up blowing things out and, and just pulling people off of Facebook left, right, and center is going to be the one that securely shares baby pictures between new parents and grandparents. If that's going to be it. Because if you roll back the clock, early 2000s, right? And Facebook's just coming up and coming. They, they, the, the, the folks that were in that grandparent generation space didn't want to do anything with Facebook. They're like, why would I talk to people online? My friends are real. I go to the cup, the donut shop and I meet them. And, and now if they've all migrated on the Facebook and they spend the majority of their time on Facebook, right? Why is that? The drawing thing for sure were the baby pictures. And no, not cat um, pictures, Paul. Cat pictures are great. Cat pictures are great for the, for the off actor. And your cat is one of my favorite cats on Twitter. But baby pictures for sure. I mean, I, I have a follow up question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, um, David, go right ahead. So I guess how, how what kind of campaign do you think could kind of be launched to kind of start that to initiate that process? I think you have to have a genuine solution in the first place. And so far, I think that there's a lot of good tries but there's nothing that's truly like you lock it and it's like, nope, this is the secure way to send those baby pictures from A to Z, from parent to grandparent, and the grandparent doesn't get frustrated to death, right? I mean, if you, if you tell a grandparent right now that they're going to have to use something like a uh, distributed wallet to pay out for file coins so that they could retrieve the baby pictures, that ain't happening. But if you tell them that they can log into a website 
that could work. Or if you tell them that they need to download an app to their phone and then log in, that could work, right? So I always look at the number of steps you have to take between I've sent somebody a text message and they've received the baby picture and, and just crunch down those number of steps to like three, <laughs> then, you're, then you're in the right track, right? But so far we just haven't seen that. So even, even before you can talk about a media campaign to get people on board with that, you have to have a genuine solution in the first place. And I honestly don't think we're there. Yeah, I, I think for the older, the non-tech savvy, in my general experience, if it involves them having to click more than three buttons or go into more than three menus and involves 10 scary acronyms, they have no idea what they mean, you know, you're... I beg it, your pardon. Well, you know, a uh, certain <laughs> uh, amazing, illustrious personage among us accepted. But I'm, I'm just saying that, well, I don't know, John. I mean, I see you sometimes, uh, some of your debates with some of your family on Facebook. I'm sure, you know, it, you strike me as you've, like all of us, probably had the uh, conversation of, wait, how do I make Zoom work again? And you're just like, it's so easy. Why am I even having this conversation? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, Zoom is a real battlefield. Yeah, I, most of the older relatives in my life uh, seem to have figured it out at this point. But early on, there were a few points I was just ready to like be like, no, I don't actually, this is not worth this. It's not worth to it. Be, to be honest, the older, the, the, not just the older, but the busier I get as a parent, it, the less cognitive load I have available. And every single click is a point mm -hmm. of friction. Every single click is an invitation to stop the process. Right. Yeah, that's, what, that's what it is. It's like, do I really have the energy for one more click? Well, do right. Really don't don't feel too bad because when you get a bit older, you'll be losing cognitive capability. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not and not to frame and not to frame it even in ages terms, but just like simply, it reminds me of like when like you know I'll you know and like first will want to show me like some internet video of his and like I'll be like whoa slow down there this is using fifteen gamer subculture acronyms that, that I don't know what twelve of them mean because I don't game twenty four seven anymore. It's not that I'm not clever enough. I just literally don't even know what you're talking about because I don't I have, have time. <laughs> I have yet to go to Urban Dictionary to find the definition of poggers, and at this point, I'm too afraid Gen to try. Gen Z loves that word, and I get how it's used in context. I'm still a little confused about where it came from, and I'm not sure I want to know at this point. Kevin, but, if I could uh, kick in a bit on top <laughs> yes, of what dude. my partner, John, has uh, said, one of our takeaways on getting people involved in what you're doing is don't rely on just one platform. That's, mm. that's not going to get you a massive audience. We, we don't have a massive audience, but we've grown our audience by going to many platforms we have a weekly podcast that we shoot mm -hmm. out to everybody that distributes a podcast. We have a YouTube channel that reproduces the podcast along with the video. Mm -hmm. We have a radio program on internet radio. We shoot out emails. We post on Facebook. We do a live Facebook show every week. So some way someone's going to see us. So mm -hmm. don't just rely on one platform because the way the, uh, media audience works is they're all over the place and you need mm -hmm. to be all over the place as well. I would certainly concur with that scoop because, you know, somebody can shout to their blue in the face at me about how Twitter is better than Facebook and I should spend most of my time on Twitter. But for whatever reason, I spend more of my time on Facebook and they're probably not going to get me to change that very ingrained habit. <laughs> you don't want to ever get into the, my, neighborhoods better than your neighborhood all neighborhoods are good so just keep them all in mind be there and uh, you'll get more people involved with what you're doing if you just mm -hmm. stick to one little corner of your neighborhood uh that's all you're going to get Mary, I think it's great advice. And uh, finally, because I know I saw he was about to ask, and then we got segued into other things, but I think Scott had a question there. I assume he did at least because we got his camera. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can yep. hear you, Scott. Well, you mentioned an a, a interesting list of tools and platforms, as some of which I know 
uh, some of which I just vaguely heard of and some of which um, yeah, I don't know at all. So uh, I think maybe some basic education on some of those would be, would be great. And I'm trying to, to put together a list of virtual, I guess, um, uh, virtual programming for Electronic Frontiers Georgia. So I wonder mm -hmm. if we could do some cross-pollination there. Well, I, I'm certainly feel free to, to DM me on Twitter or, um, you know, Kevin's got my email. So, you know, uh, I'm very happy to be contacted and, and to share notes on what worked, what didn't. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, any, any bit of that, you know, can be used or swapped out. It's very, very interchangeable. Like I mentioned on the MVP slide, really what matters is you have a group of people who are interested in talking about technology and you have some form of communication and hopefully broadcast. That's it. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll just say, Scott, you know, that we've, we've been doing these meetups for uh, years now at this point. And, and I'd certainly, you know, since things are no longer geographically limited, I'd be happy to send you my Rolodex of interesting people. Um, you know, not necessarily all of them could I still get in touch with or maybe would be interested in doing another talk. But I probably could get you a couple years of programming without that much effort, probably. We've been doing this quite a while. And it does open up some new new uh, possibilities. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, when we're we're still a wild west for us with this virtual thing, but I mean, it's it can be empowering the uh, distributed effect. I mean, our speaker uh, was it last month or the month before? Uh, she's based in New York City. You know, she's not from Austin, and but we got to hear from her and and get a wonderful talk. So, yeah, I uh, I think uh, I think you should absolutely go for it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I don't know. I mean, I'm in. I'm in the EFA matter most, though I don't check it very often. But I mean, you're also, I can put in the chat here, but you're welcome to email me, Scott, if you would like to follow up on advice for EF Georgia's programming. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, EF Georgia has an interesting distinction in the EFA where EFF Austin gets to brag we are the oldest member of the EFA, but EF Georgia is the second oldest member of the EFA. They've been around since 1996, I believe. Did I get the year right? 95. I was, I've been involved since 96. Okay, but 95 is the founding year. So they are the second oldest surviving standing of the EFA, and they've done a lot of good work fighting for these issues in Georgia, similar to us down here in Texas. So, uh, yeah, I'm a, this is a first one of these virtual meetups that's actually attracted a, uh, another EFA member, so I'm very excited we have a, a guest here. And, 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 I, and Scott, I'll just say, if uh, anybody from EF Georgia would like to speak at our meetup at some point about anything you guys are working on, we'd love to have you. Okay. Like, especially, if, especially if there's Georgia specific work or legislation that those of us outside of Georgia may be completely mm -hmm. in the dark on, I'm sure we'd all love to hear mm -hmm. about it. Is that the same EF Georgia that started back in the early 90s, like 1991 or so, 1992? Well, the, well I, the story I know is 1995, but it started with Robert Costner. Do you know that yeah. uh, name? Yeah. Yes, that was Robert. So I took over for Robert when he moved to DC. Well, Georgia was involved in, like there was the big meeting that we all went to in 1992 at Georgia Tech. And EF Georgia, I think was part of that meeting um, or somebody from Georgia. But what it was, was a bunch of groups that wanted to become chapters of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And we all showed up for a meeting where we were going to hash that out and figure out how it worked. And then EFF came in and said, sorry, guys, we decided not to do chapters after all. And, and we and spent the rest of the meeting with them kind of coaching us on how to do it on our own. And, and here we are almost 30 years later, and they're finally like, you know, they're not officially chapters but maybe eff should do chapters again and we're back to where they're they a lot started. nicer to us now than they used to be for sure i mm. mean well they they certainly they they've found i think a very good way to have best of both worlds where they don't have to waste the bandwidth ordering all of us what to do but they're still there providing help and support i i think it's been a pretty good arrangement so far yeah and i should say they they never were opposed to our existence or anything. It's just that they weren't quite sure how they could help us. Um, one thing we did uh, some years ago when Corey uh, was the EFF 
activist, uh, activist in chief, I guess, um, Corey became a non-voting member of the EFF Austin board. So he would call into all of our meetings for a while. And you might consider that again, having some, someone from the EFF be a non-voting board member. It's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, um, worth worth yeah. looking into. Also worth looking into seeing if people like Corey might like to zoom in and chat with us at some point. You know, there's no geographic sure. limitations right now. But yeah. um, but and uh, and uh, Scott for um, just so you're on the same page. John here uh, is um, the ex. Well, he's still on the board of EFF Austin, but he's our former president. I took over from him, and he's been around since our formation back in ninety ninety one uh, with the original people like uh, Ed Cavazos and uh, who are all were the others there, John Quarterman and uh, Mike Godwin and all those guys. Yeah, the name sounded familiar. So. Yeah, I, I only tell it secondhand. John tells the stories way better than I do. But uh, is at some point, John should tell you his rendition of the Steve Jackson Games raid that led to our formation, because that happened right here in Austin. He tells it yeah. well. Uh, you all hold tight. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we, uh, we don't have anywhere to be. Apparently, I said something. I suspect we may be about to get a Steve Jackson game held up to the camera, so let's, let's oh. see. <laughs> ah, yes! Oh, a copy <laughs> of the a Manual for Computer Crime. That's, That's right. right. That's right, and I'll try and uh, get this in frame here, but it was written by Lloyd Blankenship, a.k.a. The Mentor, the a.k.a. Mentor, the Hacker yeah. Manifesto, mm -hmm. and this is the book that was seized by the U.S. Secret Service. Right, they first showed up at Lloyd's house and uh, he was like, I think he wasn't even dressed and they like dragged him outside, they were talking to him and he overheard them talking to people who were at Steve Jackson games at their offices and they had a battering ram and they were gonna <laughs> batter the door and he said, no, no, I've got a key, I've got a key, I'll open it for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course, lest you think that uh, idiots uh, overreacting to nerd internet counterculture and thinking it's a nefarious plot as a thing of the past, I was literally just reading, um, and you know, regardless of the politics of any individual in this room, I think this is funny whether you're on the left or the right, but we have in the latest round of conservatives think there is a search engine conspiracy against them. We have Eric Trump apparently tweeted today that there is a conspiracy where Google is altering search results if you search for the word mob, because instead of Antifa mobs, it's bringing up images from the anime Mob Psycho 100. So, uh, yeah, the Steve Jackson Games raid and idiots thinking it's a manual cyber crime, we still have people doing that who are in charge of the country. <laughs> It, uh, it may have been true, and, and, and I'll count on all of you to correct my history on this one, but it may have been true that Lloyd was actually war dialing and getting into certain spaces that he wasn't really supposed to as he was getting the base material for this particular book. Well, I'm oh, just Lloyd to... would never have done that. None of those members of the Legion of Doom would have done that. Just like I have never done something <laughs> like touring a movie I don't own. Never. There you go. <laughs> I, I hear nothing. I see nothing. Right? <sighs> you know, they may have come through the window, but they didn't break anything. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, you uh, you guys make these uh, fun. I uh, I miss them in person, but they're a decent substitute. Uh, and yeah. does anybody else have a final question before I uh, mercifully let us all go into the night? <laughs> Anyone? Cool. Well, thank you all so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for Alex for a very interesting talk. I think I think we all learned a lot about a topic that all of us nerds are very interested in. Um, Feel free to come back anytime. Feel free to recommend any speakers. Feel free to follow up with me with the projects you've got ongoing. Uh, we are <laughs> asking that comment wall. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, it, this was great. And uh, really, uh, really admire the that you've uh, worked professionally on these projects and keep trying to push them forward. And uh, definitely get at me with uh, 
your projects via email or Twitter are happy to try to help. And uh, if you know of much like uh, you were referred to me at our talk back uh, in April, if you know of anybody else interested, interesting in this space, by all means, uh, send them our way. And thank you also, Paul, for chiming in. Beaker Browser sounds absolutely fascinating. I look forward to trying it out at some point. And John, thank you for uh, servicing my email request so promptly. You were awesome. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, hopefully John we'll is the man. Sorted out. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, and I guess I'll just do a quick uh, shout out as well to anybody who's still here. Also, um, if you're looking for other cool Austin organizations, as I've said a few times, Aslan's with Tech Workers Coalition. They fight for unions for tech workers and other cool things. So uh, support them. Go to their events when they have them. They're working on vital, important stuff. Because uh, I would join a union if tech worker unions were really a widespread thing, which they're not. So we should support the people trying to fix that. <laughs> Yeah, and also while there's uh, uh, a lot of chapters have a focus on unions, we're really just focused on tech worker stuff in general. So uh, we had, uh, like it's been a year now, but we had like people from Volk uh, do uh, a uh, come and speak about tech cooperatives. And uh, there's also a lot of other activists, employee activists like Google Climate Strike type stuff that we like keep people in the loop on, so. All good stuff, all good stuff. And, oh, and I guess, um, you know, as I've also put out one final shout out to any of you who are in Austin. Please sign the facial recognition petition I uh, put out and share it round because, you know, I, I need it to go viral if I don't want to have to knock on all my friends' doors one by one. So, you know, step one, sign it. Step two, if you've signed it, share it and harass your friends because you'll prevent me from growing, going gray prematurely having to manually harass people, which is really hard given COVID. So I appreciate it. I was going to sign it twice, but I'm afraid Trump would show up at the door. <laughs> Well, if if you think that Steve Adver would fall for you signing it twice, I'm not necessarily against you doing that, though I didn't say you should do it either. Possible deniability. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, I Thanks. hope to see you all back here for October. Um, as I said, our board member Riddick should be talking. Should be some interesting stuff. So hopefully we'll see you all then. Adios. Later, Bye. 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 Bye.